Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to DC 310, our class on church and uh, history administration. Let's pray and we will get started. Somebody could pray, please. Let's start. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, as we are uh, understanding about uh, church and ministry administration, uh, as you have called us, you have given a purpose in our heart. God, I just pray that you'll help us to understand uh, the practical and the spiritual aspects that we are learning so that uh, we can do the commission that you have given us so that we can preach the gospel to the ends of the world and we can lift up your name. I give all my classmates in their hands. Be blessed, Pastor Ashish over here. And God, we just pray for a good Wi-Fi connection throughout this session so that nothing will be a distraction to us. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, Sorry, I missed class last week. I was not uh, the to do the class, but we will continue from where we paused two weeks ago. We um, we talked about volunteer management. Uh, just some practical things on how we can engage volunteers and uh, in church in Christian ministry. That's a very important part because. A lot of the work, especially in a church context, uh, is done by volunteers. And volunteers will be serving, they'll be working along with church staff. And so we need to know how to you know, have both sets of people, church staff who are full time working with the church. And those who are volunteers who are giving a little bit of their time, their, uh, their skills, how to have them all work together in a very peaceful way. In a very cooperative way. That's a very important part uh, for a good, uh, you know, healthy local church and local uh, Christian ministry. Any questions on volunteer management before we move forward to the uh, next lesson? Any questions? I think that's a good question. Master. Yeah. We answer. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, any questions on volunteer management? Any thoughts? Okay, so let's move forward uh, to our next chapter. I will share the screen. We will move forward. So, I want to talk a little bit on communications um, that is between, uh, so communications. Let's say communications. Uh, it is communications within, among the church staff, the people are working together. There is also communications between the church and say volunteers, the church and the congregation, and the church and the wider audience, you could say the world, right? So there are different levels or different kinds of communication uh, that we need to be aware of and be ready to do, right? That means, I'll just repeat that. So there is internal communication, which is within the church staff and all the people are working together as a team. Uh, we have to coordinate so that the communication has to be very strong, very good. There is also communication between the church and all the volunteers, the people who are coming and helping, you know, in different times of the week or the month. And there's also communication between the church and the congregation. You know, from your people out there, the church needs to keep them informed. And then there's communications between the church and the crowd, you know, the, the world around that we are trying to reach. Now, uh, in the in times past, uh, we used to have brochures. We used to have printed communications. You know, so oh, please pick up the brochure on your way out or please pick up the uh, uh, what is it called brochure or we used to call it uh, bulletin yeah bulletin 
please pick up the church bulletin on your way out after service or something like that. And so all the information is to be, you know, in printed form. So please pick up the bulletin or something. Please look at the notice board. Those, those were the ways we used to do it. But now, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, dig digital communications has come in, uh, our form or medium of communication has changed. So we can now communicate almost instantly. We can communicate many times during the week uh, through digital, you know, whether an email or WhatsApp message, uh, so many things. And we can also communicate very creatively through videos and graphics, and so many. Things. So um, uh, communications has really changed, uh, hopefully for the better. Uh, it's you know, given us opportunity to communicate more often and more easily and uh, less expensive. Before we had to print bulletins, of course, all of that costs. Uh, you know, now it's it doesn't cost anything to send an email or send a WhatsApp message, uh, for the most part, right? So, uh, so let's talk a little bit. So, just some basic guidelines. You know, how do we communicate? Now, uh, why is communication important? Uh, one is uh, people, you know, need to feel informed there's there's you know it, it, it creates that enthusiasm or the zeal it keeps people zealous for the church right uh, when they feel informed oh this is what church is doing this is what church, they feel that that enthusiasm for them the, the house of god is you know is maintained so communication is part of that you know the more we um, if we communicate correctly people can really feel enthusiastic about church and the ministry and what we're doing if they don't hear from us, <laughs> they think, oh, church is not doing anything. Everything is quiet. They won't, you know, that, that zeal and the passion is, can just go away. People feel connected uh, when they're informed. They say, okay, I am part of this community. Uh, it's a form of connecting them. Yeah, and they know what's happening in the church. So some important information. It also gives them a sense of ownership. Uh, if especially if they're able to contribute towards some decisions, they feel like, okay, I am part of this. So, so we are not just doing a one-way communication, but it's a two-way. Uh, they can give their ideas, they can give feedback, they can give their uh, inputs. So there's a two-way communication. Then they feel part of uh, what is happening uh, when they are when they're able to contribute uh, to the decisions. Uh, there is. Uh, also alignment, that means everybody can move in the same direction. Yeah, yeah we, we are all going to doing the same thing. So there is alignment uh, in, in, in what's happening. Uh, people can also feel very cared uh, when they, you know, if an enemy communication comes in a timely manner, if they receive a call, uh, they receive an encouraging word, uh, they receive something that really helps them. They feel cared for by the church. So communication is a way of expressing it. Of course, we want to inform people about where things are, you know, uh, what is happening in different areas of ministry. That's a way to inform them. And also internally, uh, you know, when we share stories, when we share testimonies, uh, employees or staff will feel inspired. Right? So these are uh, there's a lot of benefits for having good open communication. Now. Uh, the ne next point, uh, uh, the thought that I want to, I want us to think about is um, communication should be two ways. Okay? That means uh, sometimes all our communication is only one way. I talk, you listen. But what if they want to say something? Right? What if they want to share an idea? What if they want to give feedback? So we should have channels. For dialogue, that means so people to talk back, talk to us. Now, of course, uh, we cannot have dialogue when we do like a mass email or a mass broadcast or WhatsApp message. It's, that is all one way communication. So we need to think about how can we give opportunity for people to engage with us, right? So some 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 thoughts. Uh, well, one is uh, if we have an email ID that says feedback, and that's what we do. We have an email ID that says feedback at apcw.org, where any person in the church 
if they have a thought, if they have an idea, or even if they have a complaint or something, they can always send an email to that, and it will reach us. And you know, we can listen to that. We can find out what's going on. That's one way. The the other option is that um, uh, in smaller groups, right? So in all our teams uh, that that are that are set up. We have times for discussion or uh, brainstorming uh, where people who are involved in that particular area of ministry can contribute. Right, so it's uh, that's easier to manage because it's very focused. It's focused on that particular area. We sit down and okay, what shall we do? What can we do? We ask questions. We brainstorm, and so on. So that that happens with smaller, smaller, smaller teams, uh, so that people can contribute. To those things. The other thing uh, which we do from time to time is to have a, what we, we we call it like open house. Uh, of course, in the past we've done it online so that people can uh, connect from anywhere. Open house means uh, you can ask us any questions, anything about church. Right? So anyone can connect and ask. Uh, so, before you know we went online our open house used to be in person so one or two sundays in a year we'll say okay it's open house every you can all stay back and ask live after service those are interesting you stay back ask any questions about the church or give any feed so that those things we've done in the past and then we we do we do it online now because then it makes it a little easier for people uh, and they can connect from any location, and uh, we can have an open house online where people just ask any questions about the church. So doing that once a year, twice a year is useful. Um, so people can, and similarly for our staff, um, staff meetings happen every month. Uh, we let different people participate, ask questions, interact, and so on. And uh, uh, the 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 idea of you know giving ongoing constructive feedback is always open. So people can give us feedback anytime, you know. So there is there are channels by which they can, whether it's the staff or people in the congregation, they can give feedback to us. So that's very important. We should listen. I'm not saying we can do everything that people say, because people have all kinds of ideas. But we have to listen and please acknowledge that we have heard what you said. And if we have something to respond, we can respond. So, okay. uh, another important thing is, and this is this is very important. Our communication must be open, honest, and direct. Right? Because this is what builds trust among people. Now think about the congregation, right? Think about the people who are coming to church. They're coming and they're part of the church because they trust. They trust the leaders, they trust the pastors. They're also trusting the community. Right? That I will be safe in this community, I will grow spiritually, I will grow in my love for Jesus, I can serve the Lord. So they are giving us their trust. And we have to, you know, the way we serve, the way we communicate, we should only affirm and strengthen the trust that they have given to us. And for that, our communication must be open, it must be honest, and it must be direct. Open means that uh, we are ready to share necessary information and if something has gone wrong we should accept it at least you know uh, first in, in a relevant manner that means to the people who i need to tell i need to tell that hey we made a mistake if i need to say this to the whole congregation i need to say it to the whole congregation if i need to say it to a particular group of people i need to say it to them right but it has to be honest, and I need to take responsibility. 
I'm not going to say I, I mean the pastors, the leadership. Uh, they need to be honest. Like if they made a mistake, maybe they made a mistake. And we need to be direct. That means state things very clearly. Don't cover up. Don't, um, you know, uh, beat around the bush and cover up the things. What needs to be said about our success, about our failures, about changes, we need to communicate very clearly. So communication is important because it is through that communication we are going to build the trust of the people. And when people trust us, they will be committed. You know? So if people don't trust us, and if they feel like, hey, he's not telling the truth, their commitment will go down. And at some point, they may leave the church also. The commitment to the church will become almost nothing. They will just feel free to leave. Because what has happened is, they, they become suspicious about our communication. Yeah, they're not telling us the truth. Actually, uh, the real issue is something else, and they're giving us a different story, right? And if they become suspicious, if they think that's what we're doing, you know, and, 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 and in fact, if that's what we're doing, uh, the level of trust and level of commitment will go down. So that's why uh, having uh, open, honest, and direct communication, especially about very important matters that matters that affect the community, that affect the church. We need to speak, we need to say, share. Uh, so, and, I, and I'll, I'll, share, I'll, I'll share a little later, like how we do this, some of the things that we practice. Um, I'm just sharing the principles. Also, when we're communi communicating with a congregation, the church congregation, or if it's a Christian ministry communicating with the donors, uh, we must not over overdo communication. I mean, don't keep sending an email every day. <laughs> That's it. You know, if we get too many emails, too many messages every day, uh, it can be overbearing. Right. So it should be regular, but not too much. So as a rule. Uh, what we have been practicing is maximum two emails in a week, maximum two WhatsApp messages in a week. The plus one, that is, if there is an emergency, then yeah, we can send one extra email. Like, you know, uh, something has happened, there's a change of location. You know, something, uh, an emergency, uh, or if there's going to be a funeral, then, okay, we, we can send an extra email. But otherwise, no more than two emails in a week, no more than two WhatsApp messages in a week. That's our rule. Okay? So that people don't feel that, hey, they are, I'm getting a message every day from the from the church, uh, you know, then they will, they may, may not like it. So we have to be regular, but don't overdo it. We need to be sensitive to how much we can communicate. And then we take advantage of that. You know, we can put other information on the church website. So uh, if people are interested, they can go to the church website. They get, have a list of all the events that are coming up or other information, whatever they want. It's all on the website. So, so we just point them there. So this is something to just think about that when you're communicating with the congregation, uh, keep it regular, but don't overdo it. Don't do uh, you know too much. Uh, some biblical notes here. Uh, the Bible tells us that our speech or our communication must be with grace. It must be seasoned with salt, uh, so that we know how to speak. So it must be gracious, kind, and it should be wise. Seasoned with salt means hey, there's there's thought. There is wisdom uh, in this communication. You're not just speaking your mind, just saying what you want. No, it is there's grace and there is wisdom in it. You're com communicating carefully, whether it's written or oral, however you're communicating. And um, uh, Paul tells Timothy, you know, says, uh, "Be an example for the believers in your speech, mm -hmm. how you are communicating. Uh, be an example to the believers." In, in speech. 
clear on that. Okay? Um, and our communication should not be dictatorial, uh, domineering, controlling. It should be kind, it should be gracious, it should be compassionate. So, some practical things here. One, uh, use good English, or, you know, if you're using some other language, uh, any other regional language, whatever uh, language you're doing it. Uh, uh, I'll just speak about English now. So, that means use good English, right? Because if you make spelling mistakes, you make grammar mistakes, uh, our English is not good, it leaves a bad impression especially if you're in an urban context, right? If you're communicating with people who are, you know, are professionals, they are used to, you know, working in the, all these corporate jobs and they're interacting with people globally. Um, of course, their expectations are much higher uh, of how we communicate. So uh, we need to be on par, we need to be at that level, you know? So, and nowadays, you know, uh, we have so many tools Right, that we can use. So if you're, when you're typing in your Word, Word document, it auto, does auto correct. It gives you correct your spelling, correct your grammar, it corrects everything. So uh, we can make adva take advantage of those tools and to make sure that our English is good. Uh, use good etiquette. That means, uh, you know, uh, not only the English, that the, the grammar and the spelling is good, but how we communicate. The the courtesy, the manner in which we communicate should also be good, right? So we uh, we use proper salut salutation, you know, so greeting so-and-so or so uh, salutation, uh, uh, applaud, express gratitude, um, instead of commanding, you place a request. So it's just saying, uh, uh, example, so it's just saying, Make sure you come at four o'clock. So that's like a command. But instead, you could say, "Could you please come at four? Or shall we meet at four four p.m.?" So that's that's a better way to communicate. That's that's making it a request rather than saying, uh, "Come at four o'clock," or "Make sure you come at four o'clock." So just how we say it could leave could could make such a difference. Uh, how the person receives it. Um, uh, be patient with people within reason. So uh, 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 that, that means, you know, in our interactions and in our communication, uh, example, example. Suppose somebody is pointing out a problem or, or some, and, and, and things may happen often in a church setting. They want to debate a theological issue. Uh, example. And this happened recently. One person sent me an email. I don't believe in tithing. <laughs> Why do you say we have to tithe? And uh, this person was very, uh, you know, uh, what to say, so almost seemed like ready to argue. So, I responded, I said, you know, you're free to hold your opinion. You, you know, if you want to say you don't want to tithe, you're not forcing anybody to tithe. Uh, I just said, you know, here are the reasons why I believe tithing is something we do as we just believe. I gave the scriptures and I just sent it back. I replied to the email. Then the person asked, is this open for debate? Then, so now, you know, it's almost like it's getting into a place of uh, kind of argument or something, you know. So I had to be very careful how I responded. Uh, I simply, uh, I didn't answer the question, is it open for a debate? Because I don't want to get into uh, a back and forth email and debate. I don't want to get into that. So I just said, you are free to examine the scriptures and come to your own conclusions and follow your own conclusion. That's it. Basically, I'm saying I'm not interested in a debate. I have given you the scriptures. You can study the scriptures, you make up your minds and you go. Then so I left it at that. Then I got another email there. 
they are explaining all the reasons why they feel that I didn't even respond to it. So we are patient with people. So I'm just giving this as an example where, you know, uh, sometimes there can be this kind of uh, from people who are coming to church, they may argue about, they want to argue about something theological, something like that. You're, you're patient within reason. That means, look, I'm not going to change our belief, but I'm willing to share with you, but I don't want to get into an argument. I don't want to get into any, you make up your own mind, you're free to have your own opinions. So that will have to be careful. You know, rather than getting into some back and forth debate on email, no, 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 just, you know, you make up your mind, be patient with people, uh, be kind. Uh, now, I say don't harm the organization means we have to be careful. Is that person in any way affecting the community? Okay. So, for example, if, if the same person started, you know, sending emails to everybody saying, hey, why are you tired? Then I would handle that differently and say hey uh, please don't disturb other people you know, don't trouble other people if you have a question we'll answer your question but don't go and disturb others with all these things so we don't want to harm the community but uh, so we have to be careful on that. Uh, be kind with people so um, in our communications, we have to always be kind. Sometimes people can irritate us and trouble us and sometimes criticize us. So when I get emails that criticize or, um, you know, try to keep pointing flaws, uh, I just leave it aside. For example, you know, um, this started some time back, I don't know when, but you know, there was one person who almost every week he'll send an email and he'll be pointing out something wrong in our church service. <laughs> in the beginning, when I first started receiving emails from this person, I thought this person was genuine. Like, yeah, he will point out maybe music was too loud or worship leader was not standing properly. Worship leader was not taking communion properly when whole, everybody was... Almost every, so initially I thought, okay, this person is genuine. He wants to help us. So I acknowledged to acknowledge that email and then I should share that feedback with whoever, you know, whoever needs to know. Then it was happening every week and he would, this person would pick on the silliest of things. Then I realized, and it was upsetting me, right? Either on a Sunday or a Monday, I'll get one email from this person. Something was wrong in the service. And it was really upsetting me. Like, what is this? Some small thing he will point out. Sometimes it'll be in my sermon, how I spoke, how I was walking on the stage, uh, what shirt I was wearing. So many things, you know, all kinds of things. The email will come. Then I realized, okay, you know what? I'm not, I'm just not going to answer and I am not going to be troubled by this email. I'll just leave it. And so I just stopped even responding. Uh, just, okay, I don't want to get in any kind of fight or argument of this. Okay, they can say, you know, they can say. So uh, we just have to be kind. We can't, you know, let that offend us and retaliate or anything. So these things happen. Um, we need to thank people and, you know, wherever possible, respond promptly. You know, when people send an email or message, respond promptly. Uh, let me just move on. Um, number three, uh, in our communication, uh, I think these are three golden words. Please, thank you, and so use these words lavishly. Okay. So yeah, every sentence, Know, try to use please. Could you please do this? Or thank you for this. Or if you make a mistake, say I'm sorry. Or I'm so I apologize. I am not able to meet you today. Can we meet another day? Whatever. So these are three golden words uh, that, especially in written communication, 
we need to use these words because uh, when we write an email, uh, it's only letters. The emotion is given by the person who's reading it. You know, so the person who's reading it, in their minds, they they can make up anything. They can even attribute to the text, the email, uh, emotions or thoughts that you you were not having or you were not even thinking about. So we have to be very careful. But that's why when we say please or thank you, sorry, it's like you know, uh, it's it's trying to make that uh, emotion very gentle, very kind, uh, very gracious. Okay. Um, uh, in conversations, discussions. You share an idea as a suggestion, not as a mandate. Um, when there are times when we have to say something must be done, you know, uh, something that's very important has to be done, and you say, "Hey, we must get this done." But otherwise, most of the time, we are presenting our ideas as a suggestion and say, "Hey, you think about it, or let us think about it. How do we do this? Or you know, do you think about this? Or should you consider? How about exploring this option?" So basically, we are introducing our ideas as a suggestion most of the time. That means we're saying, hey, let's do this together. Uh, there may be times that when we say, oh, this is very important, this has to be done. Some matters that are very critical. Uh, but otherwise, try to keep our, uh, you know, our uh, communication as ideas and suggestions, not, not as a mandate. Um, this thing we have, uh, this part number five, we already discussed earlier that when you are discussing difficult matters, always do it in person or on a video call. It's, it's better to sit and talk uh, rather than just sending an email or a WhatsApp message. Say, so, hey, can you come and meet me? Then sitting together, we can discuss the matter. Or if uh, the, you know, if the person is in a different place uh, or far away, then we can do it on a video call. And uh, so. Difficult matters, always do it in person or on video call. Um, uh, when you're communicating, be clear. So there has to be clarity okay, about what you're saying, to whom you're saying, and why you're saying it. Uh, if the, if the, if the, if the, it's, it's, there is no clarity, um, you know, and then people are left hanging. They, they don't know what exactly you're trying to say. So uh, consciously, and you check. You know, am I speak? Then am I am I communicating clearly? Is the message clear? Number seven. Uh, when you when you when you're doing things by email, try to keep it short. Don't write long emails because most people won't read it. So you know nowadays people don't like to you know spend time reading long long things. So. Uh, keep emails short, brief, as simple as possible, um, and of course use technologies to communicate. So these are some thoughts here on communication, just trying to keep it simple. So uh, from a church perspective, uh, some of the things that we try to follow, like I said, um, one is uh, we Try to do just two emails a week, just two WhatsApp messages in a week, nothing more. Our Sunday announcements also follow a five by five rule. That means only five announcements, five items, and within five minutes. The whole year. So our video announcements normally uh, that is in from start to finish. So, you know, the beginning, the intro and the outro have standard information like, you know, giving and so on. And then only five items, uh, apart from the standard intro and outro, every Sunday, only five, we try to keep it, only five things you talk about in the announcements. And that's it, we done. So we try to follow that, a five by five rule. Now, yeah, there will be some exceptions. Some Sundays we may have to announce uh, extra things. Then, yeah, if they're really important, we have to include it. But our general rule is just talk about five things because people are not going to remember more than five things. Uh, five announcement items. Keep it within five minutes. 
Um, if we have to do a report, like suppose there's a mission for some conference happen, even that report say, okay, keep it within one minute, that report. So don't make a long report. Just one minute, show the highlights. So that will add that in those Sundays, maybe we'll have an extra minute, five plus one, six minutes, six, seven minutes maximum. So we have, even in our communication in our Sunday service, through the announcements, we're trying to be very brief, keep it short. Uh, only like mid, uh, on a New Year's Day service, we do a you know, year in review video to recap the whole year. That will be about eight minutes, generally. So we are conscious of uh, those things. The rest of the information, uh, we keep it on our website. So that keep our website updated so that people can go uh, look at information, events, uh, things that are happening in church. So that information is always updated on our church website. Church website is updated every week. So uh, content is kept up to date. Okay. Uh, any questions about communication from the church, uh, amongst church staff? So go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. I have a few personal questions, maybe, but uh, I just want to know, do you take care of all the communication, like all the feedbacks uh, from the church people? Like, how do you manage your time on that? How do you find, like, you said you send two messages, two emails, that's that's from the sending part. But uh, even about the receiving part, if people are sending too much emails to you, people might send, we have a very big congregation. So do you prefer to answer, like, one or two a day, or how do you take care of that? Yeah, so the fact is, uh, we get lots of emails every day. Like, so uh, emails are coming in from all over the world, right? It's, it's not just our own congregation writing to us, but there are emails coming from people all over the world, uh, and all kinds of emails. So, how do we handle this? So I don't handle all the emails. I handle all the emails that come directly to my email ID, but even that is a lot. Right? So, but generally we have um, somebody who handles all our emails. So example, emails that go to contact. So that's where most of the emails come. Um, they go to contact at atc.org. So that comes, that's the general public right, person. So emails to contact, the uh, emails that come to prayer, that is people sending in prayer requests. Uh, there are emails that come into member care, that is our church people asking for some help. Uh, there's emails that come into feedback or testimony. So all these emails, I see them, but I don't respond to them. So those emails are handled by one dedicated person. So we have one dedicated person, uh, Smitha. So she handles She's in charge of communication. So it's her responsibility to read all the emails and respond. So that's like almost like a job, you know, it's like a dedicated person, right? So uh, because also there are so many emails coming, she is responsible. And then if that email needs to be sent to somebody else, she will forward it, you know, if it's whatever, depending on that email. Uh, so she's the one who reads, responds, and follows all the emails here. Now, even emails that come to me directly, uh, there's a lot of emails, and honestly, I, I don't read all my emails. I can't, I cannot read all my emails. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, so I will select. I will only, uh, I will look at the emails. I mean, I just who's coming, from, who's come from. Uh, and uh, so I, I will respond to the ones that are important, the ones that I know I, I need to respond, things like that. Uh, uh, especially within our staff, amongst them. Even then, I'm not able to keep up with all the emails, but just within our staff, because so many things are happening. Um, yeah, I don't know. So personally, I may get probably my inbox, let's say, I'm just estimating, maybe I maybe more than 100 emails every day coming in to, directly to my 
Okay. So I, I, I can I cannot read all of them. Uh, I cannot personally respond to so that. So what I've done is I've created separate folders for all our staff because they are important. So any email that comes from our staff goes directly to their their particular folder. So I know that, okay, example. Pastor Jay Kumar, it goes directly to his folder. So, uh, okay, I have to read his email and respond. Now, I may not be able to do it today, sir, but sometime during the week, I'll go to his folder. I will look at his emails. I can respond to him. So these all our staff, at least in my inbox, all our church staff have a folder. So when an email comes from a particular staff, it goes directly to that folder. So I'm already automatically uh, segregating those emails because those are, I have to go and look at this. All the other emails go to a common folder, which means everybody others email for a common folder. So that's something I actually am not able to read. Um, and I'll just quickly glance. If I see something or that I need to respond, I would respond. Uh, so that's why you know we have somebody dedicated to handle the, all other emails. And uh, only the important ones are those. And then some emails are more uh, more of a documentation, meaning uh, they're more for keeping records. So especially uh, all our um, financial matters. So there'll be lots of emails on, on our accounting and all that. I don't read all that, but they're just going in there as a record. Like, okay, I, ha I have a record. If I want to go back, I can go and look at it. I can pick it up. Uh, so uh, a lot of those accounting type emails. I don't need to handle it because there's an accountant who handles it. But I get a copy. It's in my bar, in, in, in my folder. It's in a separate folder. Um, but I can always go and read it if I want. I can always look it up. But I don't read it because uh, there's an accountant who is responsible for that. So again, that's, that's another category of emails. Similarly, there are missions related emails. Uh, I don't read all of them. These will be reports from all our churches and our outreach pastors. I don't read all of them, but it's there. If I want to, I can always go back and I can look it up. But there's somebody who's handling mission. So I know that, okay, those emails are being handled by whose person has was handling mission. So I know those emails are being handled. So that's why I, I don't need to read them, but I do get, you know, it's already in my inbox. Uh, and again, it goes to a particular folder. So if at any point I want to know, hey, what's happening in the church over, you know, say in Pahima, I can just go to the missions folder uh, and I can just open up the latest report. Every month they send a report. Uh, so I can open the report. I can say, oh, that's what is happening. But I don't read it every month. Like every email, I don't read it. I, I won't be able to read it. Yeah. So that's kind of what happens in real life. <laughs> Good. Any other question on communications in church and ministry? I have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. So we see so many rumors spreading inside the church. I have seen in some churches a lot of rumors spreading within the church or about the church outside. Uh, has anything like that happened over here? And if a rumor spreads, how do you actually? handle it any kind of rumors maybe rumors about you or the congregation or any kind of things. yeah so uh, it's like when people and so basically i think if and when when people start talking negative about the church or spreading information that's negative about the church uh, how do you handle it uh, how should you handle it now has it happened to us? Uh, you know, uh, let me say this. I've heard some things now and then about all people's church. You know, uh, but uh, so as an example, I give you some silly. These are some silly things. You know, but way back in our journey, uh, in, uh, in in I forget the year, but I'm thinking 2004, 2005. We moved into an auditorium that was air conditioned. So we used to meet in, in a different auditorium and we outgrew that. We moved into an auditorium 
that was an air conditioned auditorium, which is uh, uh, near MJ Road. So then somebody's, you know, again, this is like a rumor on things spreading. Somebody came and said, oh, people are calling APC as an air conditioned. I don't know what they call it. Some fun. They're just, you know, in a speaking very, very bad, like as it was our mistake to be using an air conditioned auditorium for certain service, you know? Now, when I heard it, I was like, I have people not even bothering to say, you know, we just needed an auditorium. We found an auditorium. It happened to be air conditioned. We are meeting in it. It's not a big deal. And so I, when people, when I hear something, when I heard something, I just let it go. You know, I, I don't bother. Uh, there may have been another, uh, you know. So like that, now when then I've heard some silly things. Most of this are these things that people talk about are silly. So for example, uh, I've heard somebody say, oh, uh, APC is an MNC church, meaning we are catering to people from who are working in multinational companies. No. So, I mean, it is true that uh, a, a big number of people who come to our congregation are working in multinational companies because uh, they're professionals and so on. Uh, but for people to use that as a to talk about us in that way, uh, I mean, I just heard it. I just let it go. I said, like, you know, I'm not. It, it's like I, I don't. I don't. And then I've heard sometimes somebody say, "Oh, uh, this pastor was comparing, you know, this church with that ABC with other church." The pastors were talking. Sometimes somebody. So whenever I hear these kinds of things, I just let it go. I don't even pay attention to it. I don't even think about it a second time in the sense that I don't waste any time on it. So uh, to answer your question, are there people, kind of rumors or things that people say about APC? Maybe there are. Uh, I've heard some few things. Do I pay attention to it? I don't. In my, I, in my mind, I just tell myself, I'm here to serve God. I'm here to serve people. And I just want to keep my heart and mind clean and just do that. And that's it. So I just don't let that distract. Okay. So yeah, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back right after break and we get into our next. Yes. Thank you.